Hi, and welcome to another edition of ProBlind, brought to you by the fine folks who support us here at the Grassroots Community Network. We want to take the opportunity for you to get to know the folks who are running to represent you on city council. And today we get to have a conversation with Sam, Samuel Rose, uh, goes by Sam. Uh, Sam, welcome. Thank you. Hey, thanks for taking the time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. So um, you want to run for city council. I do. I am. Yeah. How's that going? It's going great, honestly. I, I think I started from uh, mostly nothing because I don't have like a campaign team or anything like that. But I put in so much work. I've had so many momentum boosts. I've, I've met with so many people. I've gotten so many supporters, so many people that I consider to be very notable in this community. Had so many wonderful conversations. Really think I've gotten the issues down. And uh, you know, even though it's been a roller coaster of emotions for sure, I think overall I'm winning either way. Have you done this kind of thing before, run for office? I have not, no. I've always considered myself a leader um, in the room or wherever I am, but I've never run for political office. So what got you off the couch to do it this time, or do this? So I have a strong belief in local government. I believe local government should be more important to us than federal government. My father, and uh, I grew up in St. Albans, Vermont, he was on city council there for 20 years, and I saw the impact he had on the community. I saw what a great role model he was for the community, and I believe that I have something to offer to do the same here in Aspen. And, and was there any kind of particular issue or interest about being on city council where you said, well, I've, I can add to that voice? Yeah, so I'm the lead case investigator for COVID here in the county. And I believe that the number one priority right now is getting us through and out of the pandemic, which I feel like I'm most well equipped to lead. But also just the way my mindset works, I feel like I've been uh, do a really good job of getting us to the proper goal setting that we need to solve the other issues in this town, like affordable housing, workforce housing, transportation, child care, and everything else that goes along with it. What is a lead case I know I'm leading, leaving a word out, the lead case, case investigator. investigator do. So when someone tests positive for COVID-19, it gets reported to us over at Pickens County Public Health. And I'm usually the person that calls that person, um, talks them through what they need to do, who they um, at, were in close contact with and who might need to quarantine, all those protocols, and then find out where they might have gotten uh, contracted the virus it's all great data collection to keep our town safe and then to also help prevent further spread in the future. So I might know that as contact tracing yes. in some way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but we start, uh, the distinction there is when someone tests positive their case and then we contact trace them to get their contacts to quarantine. So case investigation, contact tracer, sort of like two sides of the same coin. I'm curious, has there been much resistance to that? Uh, there has been. and I mean, it's a great example of why I'm running for city council because I've realized in many things in life, including contact tracing, we're too much of an idealist. We expect a certain system to work and work perfectly, but the pragmatism in me, and that's why I'm running on being a pragmatic approach type guy, um, sees that there has been a lot of resistance, but there's been a lot of people who lie, lie by omission, but I think will end up doing the right thing we just need to make sure we're getting the information to them. So my pragmatic approach would be to like, do more and better communication like in places like the newspaper, grassroots TV, and really help our, keep our community safe that way. That's wonderful. How did you get into that? You know, I... It's just not have, a career choice we made in college. No, no. You know, life is fluid and life is a journey for me. And when I saw the opportunity to be the lead case investigator, I jumped on it. I mean, I'm also a volunteer firefighter. I'm also a response advocate for uh, survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence. And lead case investigation goes hand in hand with everything I do and believe. I care so deeply about this community. And it was such an honor to be able to help people through the pandemic as much as I have. And that started maybe a year ago, or half a year ago. Yeah, I started uh, being the lead case investigator in July. Oh, wow. Yeah. What were you doing before that? Before that, um, I was working for a group and tour services at Aspen Ski Company when the season got cut short. 
and then I went home to Vermont for a little while and I put myself together. I did the Johns Hopkins contact tracing course to better equip myself for um, getting into the lead case investigation. And I got that job and I've been just like building myself back up ever since. And, w and how long have you been in Aspen? Uh, two years now. I'm and, a relative newcomer. And where before that? Uh, well, I grew up in Vermont. I went to the University of Denver. I worked in Denver for a couple years in satellite imagery and cartography. Um, then I went and bought a round-the-world plane ticket, and I've been to 72 countries since, volunteering in places like Norway, Israel, Argentina, and um, one other I'm forgetting, I think. But it, it's been uh, definitely a journey that led me here. And Volunteering doing what? Well, in Israel, I was teaching English to um, kids that um, wouldn't otherwise have a, a native English speaker teaching English to them. Um, in Argentina, in Norway, in New Zealand, I was helping on farms, um, doing like the woofing scenario, working, wor working on an organic fruit farm. Woofing. Woofing, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's called, it's called woofing, like that's like the acronym for it. So like it was an organic fruit farm in Norway. In New Zealand, I was helping a guy rebuild a cottage. And in Argentina, we were um, helping a guy build an earth ship. And an earth ship is like a fully sustainable um, building made out of recycled materials. That's amazing. I, I've always been about the adventure and about the journey. Um, Aspen, as far as like settling down goes, like this is the most adventurous and journey place you can live and not feel like uh, life ever gets stagnant. So do you feel like you're putting roots down here? I do, yeah. I mean, from the moment I got here, it just felt like home. Uh, after living in Vermont, I love Vermont, but the opportunity there is very limited. Um, after living in Denver, you realize that Denver is not the mountains, you want to live in the mountains. And then after living in Aspen, you realize Aspen's such a true and wonderful community, unlike other ski towns. It's a really special place, and it's a place that I'd love to live for a really long time. So what, what about it drew you here? I mean, the natural beauty, but um, the opportunity, honestly. Like, it, on any given day, you can do any number of activities. I skin up a mountain, I mountain bike, I ski, I hike, I paddleboard, it, it, you name it. It's just, we have everything but a beach, and then we do have a beach, because then we have the North Star Preserve. So it's just one of those places where, like, if you feel stagnant, there's always something else to do, and there's always someone else to do it with, and there's always things to join. I mean, th this... This place is so resource rich, it lacks a lot of palpableness that other communities have. And What do you mean by palpableness? Well, a lot of communities have like problems with um, like uh, economics for starters. Like be living in such a resource rich community and having the opportunity to better ourselves all the time is something that like a lot of places like just don't have. So it's really nice to be in a place where we can do that. That's wonderful. So from the perspective of someone who's been here Three years, you said. Two. Two. What do you see as being uh, the difficult issues? Well, it's just an expensive place to live. I, I feel like uh, Aspen sort of has two sides to it, um, the multimillionaire side and then like uh, more of like a working class side. And, you know, we wouldn't have so much money if we didn't have the multimillionaire side. I think they are amazing and they innovate and they make this community what it is. But it's the working class side that makes Aspen quirky. I mean, I grew up listening to John Denver. I've always been an old soul in that way. And the John Denver vision of Aspen is something that I really love and love to see. And the, the issues I see is just um, being able to afford to live here. But I think living here is a sacrifice if you're in the working class. And I think that's like a, a, um, something that we all put up with because if we live in a 300 square foot apartment, God willing, we have more than that. We have an out, uh, a backyard that's like with endless opportunity. That's wonderful. When you were at uh, University of Denver, yep. what did you study? I studied uh, geography, geospatial sciences, um, sustainability, and minored in business. I'm also um, like slowly working my way through a master's in finance through CU Denver right now. That's great. And then how did that then apply? I mean, was, was that a career? What am I trying to say? Yeah. This kind of linear career into working... Was it in reservations? Did I hear that right? Or group and tour services? Yeah. I would just say my life path has been like fluid in that sense. Geography, ge geospatial sciences, it's more like GIS is like the jobs that it's really tailored to. But because I studied geography, I studied like, like 
physical geography, political geography, business geography. It was a degree that I loved because it gave me a general knowledge about so many different topics. I feel really well equipped to address so many different topics because of it. And like I've gotten so much out of it because of how much I put into my informal education. And that's really important to me. Is, would you uh, describe it as being kind of the lens through which you see the world? It is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's funny. We all have like different perspectives, but I'm like the type of guy that listens to like the BBC World News podcast every morning. Like I'm very in tune with what's going on in the entire world. I feel like you learn a lot of lessons from that. It humbles you and also um, teaches you a lot about like how society works and how appreciative you should be of usually the situation you're in. Well, and then that can lead you to wanting to give back through serving, say, as a council member. Yeah, I mean, civic, uh, I've always been civic-minded. Giving back has always been the biggest thing to me. I'm not like a trust fund type of guy. I definitely um, uh, work hard for like everything I have. Um, and giving back, being, having the opportunity to give back and to volunteer is a privilege in itself, and it's one that I've taken head on. Um, volunteer firefighting has been one of the most amazing experiences I've had so far. Tell being, me about that. It's the do-it-all department. It's kind of funny. Like, geography is a learn-it-all um, type of thing. The fire department is a do-it-all. Like, fighting fires in this town, we don't have that many structure fires, but I've learned medical training. I've learned swift water rescue. I've learned ice rescue. Um, I've, I've been able to go to the wildfires. I've been able to hand out space heaters. I just like being like part of this community in like the center of town has been the most special thing I could ask for. And, and how long have you been doing the firefighting? Just over a year now. So you went through last summer and some of these wildfires. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely been an inter interesting experience. I mean, that's a big part of what I studied, but it's fun. It's kind of funny how it's like an afterthought in Vermont. We don't have wildfires. You come out west, it's like a big deal. And then you honestly realize how interconnected the world is. Wildfires caused by climate change, what do we need to address? I take all those like things into account when I'd be a city council member to understand that things like transportation and affordable housing are connected. Same with the environment. It's really eye-opening in that way. Yeah, it's, and these are such uh, intractable problems that they are connected. And how, how, how do you, how does one, mm -hmm. not how do you, yeah. but how does one really provide for employee housing and transportation while, while uh, taking care of the environment? They, they're, they're sort of in competition. Yeah, it does feel that way. Um, funny enough, today I was reading this um, memo I got about Teton County in ja like Jackson Hole, Wyoming. It's the richest county in America. They've been dealing with a lot of the same thing. The guy wrote that economic initiatives and environmental initiatives are sort of competing against one another. Ultimately, I think it comes to breaking things down and understanding things better so that e they're not competing against each, uh, each other. You find the balance and then you set a master plan that makes sure you accomplishes those goals. I, I look at it this way. We live in a valley. It's pretty easy to like understand that we don't live in Denver where you can get sprawl. We have the space that we have. So if you look at it and you like do all these studies on like migration patterns, environmental impacts and all that, you really can set a pretty um, comprehensive plan on what this community needs and what our carrying capacity is. Because I mean, we need to set goals on like um, how many people we want to, um, how, what percentage of our workforce we want to house here. And then we need to balance that with ha trying to avoid doing new development on open space. We don't want to become New York City. We don't want like a bunch of high rises. We don't want population density that makes this place an unattractive place to live. But we do want to be able to like house a lot of our workforce so that we can fix a lot of things like transportation issues and make sure that our business community has the, um, workforce and desirable workforce that we need to make this place what it is. Yeah. Whew. And it's kind of like uh, this notion of the uh, balloon is only so big. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we live in a valley, and in the wintertime, we live at a dead end. Like I said, if you look, like, look, look at an aerial shot of Aspen, you see where the houses are, you see where the commercial is, you see where the open space is. I mean, it's, it's pretty easy, not easy, but it's pretty... Um, simple to think about how comprehensive uh, a comprehensive approach would work to understanding like what the environment needs versus what the economy needs find that balance and like set a comprehensive plan to make sure that we can execute and have you have you been in 
in running for council, have you looked at like the Aspen area community plan, that kind of stuff? And yeah. what's, what's there now? Well, that was the thing. I was looking at it in, in 2012. It, the goal was to house 60% of our workforce, and then they abandoned that. Um, I think we do need to set sort of those goals. But more than anything, I, I want to address the whys of problems. Why do we need more affordable housing? And at least in my mind, and what I've heard from a lot of people I've talked to, is that it's because we need to our workforce to be able to like live and work here. So, for example, I look at the King Louis building on Main Street. Um, it's a P, like Peter Fornell's like uh, affordable tax credits. Um, it was that like sort of thing that they passed in 2010 that like built a place like that. You have the Bank of Colorado that bought units there. You have um, the residents of the Little Nell that bought units there. The private sector is so great at making sure that they have the proper housing for their uh, for their workforce, and because of that, they're going to get very high quality candidates to live there. So I, I think that's like a big thing that we need to like um, do more public private partnerships to make sure that these things get done correctly and responsibly, as opposed to APCHA building more. Yeah, housing. yeah. I've been told by everyone I'm very adamant about this because of how much I've just been. This has been hammered home to me about how inefficient not fiscally responsible, um, the pu uh, public sector is at building homes. I think the public-private partnership has been the epitome of what it should look like, especially because you can do it in a way where they get tax credits, they make money, and then responsibility is there. We look at great projects like the King Louis building, and then we look at projects like Centennial, where responsibility sort of has been like lost through the cracks. And I've been told by uh, people that live there that like water is running through the walls, but nobody knows who's responsible for that. I think we can learn a lot from the mistakes we've made in the past to make sure that the future is better for us. And how does that future look from Sam's point of view? I, th I think uh, Aspen needs to remain the quirky town that we all know and love. I think change is the only constant in this world. Development is going to happen. It's just about doing smart development. Not, not just more like holes in the ground, but more projects that benefit the people that live and work here. But, you know, in, in part of that, you're talking about, uh, I wanted to explore a little further, mm -hmm. the notion of public-private partnerships as opposed to employee housing built by APCHA. And then an awful lot of employee housing is actually owned by the people who live there as opposed to r rental yeah. stuff. Is there a benefit to having ownership in the housing or... The benefit there is like a lot of people do own homes through APSHA, but they have the 3% um, uh, availability like increase uh, every year. And because of that, there's, it, it sort of creates unintended consequences of lacking um, renovating um, that sort of project. Because even after 3% every year, they're going to be able to sell it for whatever they want, so they have no incentive to make the place better. The idea that I would like to see is more responsibility with the private sector because responsibility doesn't get lost that way. By virtue of it being a private sector, profit motivated. Yeah, but partnered with APSHA. So, I mean, the affordable housing credits work as far as I understand that like 30% of the um, units can be sold free market and then the rest get like put to APSHA. APSHA gives uh, like rents or sells the units and the credits go to the developer who makes right. money that way. And we also do it with a way um, where we have the proper goals of who we um, have in intended to live there to benefit the community. Yeah, with the various categories of yeah. income. Categories of income, and once again, I always think partnering with the business community is the overall reason. Once again, the why of affordable housing, why do we need it, is because we would need it if, um, the business community didn't have the proper housing to hire a, an adequate workforce for our town. I was talking to a Pitkin County Sheriff's deputy today. Um, they, he told me they were having trouble hiring. Um, they've been hiring people from like Glenwood Springs, Newcastle, even the guy from Gypsum. See, something like that is just like, those are the type of um, people I'd love to partner with because I think more housing for someone who enforces the law here is very important. I'm part of Pitkin County Public Health. Uh, people in my department were a part of making the decision to close down restaurants. I'm not saying right now whether that was a good or bad thing, even though I would have kept restaurants open in that sense. 
But it's interesting to me that we have people that are making decisions that close down restaurants that live in Glenwood Springs and can go out to a restaurant. So I, I think like that's a big part of living here is having more skin in the game of people that you like work with, work for, and being part of a community. When you say people who are closing restaurants live in Glenwood Springs. Well, the part of the Pickens County Public Health Department. Like, I'm, I'm the lead case investigator. Me and one other guy live in Pickens County. The rest of our team lives in, like, Eagle and Garfield County. I don't think that's, like, the biggest issue in the world. But once again, like, you have people that are, like, working for a community that can't fully understand the community if you don't live here. Well, that's true. I was just thinking about the decision making because really the decision to do that was made by the Board of Health. By the board. Yeah. yeah. By getting advice and like from people on the ground that were not here in Pickin County. Yeah. I mean, sheriff's deputies, like, if you're going to be the one in like enforcing the law, you, it'd be nice if you lived here. To be and part of that community. Yeah. I mean, uh, the city police like have a housing unit um, up behind the hospital. The sheriff's deputy, you think we could find in Pickin County. It doesn't necessarily need to be in the city, even though I think like that'd be a great thing, especially since the city of Aspen or where the lumber yard is could potentially be a solution for that because it's between like Aspen and Snowmass. But I mean, that's just like ideas that I have as far as like making sure we set the proper goals of like what people we'd like to house if we were to build new housing, especially in a public private partnership. You know, the, the setting that goal would be a community effort. Yep. But do you have any thoughts of where you'd, where you fall on that goal? In what uh, way do you mean? Oh, 20%, 40%, 60%, I mean, how do you define that goal? So I don't have it defined right now. I think that really means a lot of talk with the business community. I mean, I've talked to a lot of business owners. One of the biggest issues I've heard that some of them are able to house or like get workers, but none under the age of 40. Um, if that is like vital to their business, I think that's an issue. A lot of them like there are smaller businesses that don't have the capacity to like buy their own housing and set up their own employee housing. I think those are people that like we should work with to try to solve solutions that way. Because I ultimately think like these solutions would better the entire town. It's not just like helping one business because we're helping one business. It's helping the vitality of this town if we get like the best, the brightest and are able to like house them here and uh, maybe solve some other issues that way. If you like build a project like the Lumberyard in a public-private partnership, and we do it fiscally responsibly, we intend it so people use public transportation, we get more cars off the road, we like help, it's not solving, help our transportation issues, we help environmental issues by getting more cars off the road, like these are great things that like need, we need to think about as far as like the interconnectedness of these issues, and just like when we're planning proper goal setting and the why of every issue that we address. You mentioned something in there um, that one of the business owners you were talking to is having trouble finding employees under 40. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, yeah, he said that uh, like his business would be much better if it had diversity of thought and diversity of age. Um, I didn't really get into like further details with them, but he said it'd be great if the city was able to like help have an option for like those moving here that are really going to contribute to this community um, to find a place to live and work so you can like hire the under 40s. I mean, we have so many service industry workers that are on the younger generation side. Um, it's just like hard for them to make it work. I, I think like we could target a lot of like any housing projects to make it like easier for them. Like I said, public-private partnerships, yeah. try to avoid new development. Um, these are just like some of the ideas that I think would really further this community. That's great. We have a couple of minutes left. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I do want to make sure that I've given you a chance to get out whatever thoughts you might have, might have uh, about being on council and, and why, back to the why of things, why folks might want to back Sam. So I would say to them, um, I think first off, leading us through and out of the pandemic is such a high priority and I think I'm the best equipped to do that. Beyond that, I br think I bring a new face and fresh perspectives and fresh blood that I think people have been clamoring for. Um, I also am a volunteer firefighter and a response advocate. I think city council, it's so important to be proud of the people we elect, and I think that's something that people should think about when looking into me. And then honestly, just like how I approach every issues. I'm a pragmatist. I think about the why of issues, and I make sure that we avoid unintended consequences, and I really am looking out for the people that live and work in this town. 
Um, I, I've gotten backing from the restaurant community, retail community, um, real estate community, Jewish community, Christian community, fire community, response community. I, I am a great um, uh, bridger of divides. I'm great at working with people. I'm a great communicator. And I, I really think I would bring a lot to the table when it comes to city council. That sounds wonderful. And, and I know that um, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of confidentiality concerns about response, but it is a, a, a facet of, of your work that we haven't touched on. Yeah. And how did you find your way into that? So one of the biggest other distinguishments for, distinguishments for me is fighting for people that don't look like me, don't sound like me, and have different perspectives than me. It's very important to me, and I hope it's important to the voters of this town, that I fight for people like that. I'm not a survivor of sexual assault or domestic violence, and it means a lot to me because of the suffering that they've gone through to be able to help in any way I can. Um, it, it's been very trying because it's such a, um, it's such a, tough subject, but talking and helping people in that uh, demeanor has been like one of the most rewarding things I've experienced and um, really touches on my um, also help for mental health in this community, which I think is obviously another very important issue and something that I feel like I have um, somewhat of an expert on as well, being able to do the response advocacy. And did, you got into that, well, you had training and then you do telephone work? Information. Yeah, yeah, it's the hotline advocacy. So 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. or um, during the day on weekends, but I have my phone next to my head. And if anyone calls um, the hotline, they'll get me and I'll talk them through any situation I can. Um, it, it's been a very interesting experience, but one that I think I've um, done a really good job with. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, one last question real quickly. Yes. You've been to a variety of places around the world. Did you bring in any thoughts from those back to Aspen of how we could do it better? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I, I think Aspen's unique. I, I would say one thing, and this is not even from travel, but well, it sort of is. Um, one of the things I've been working on with a lot of restaurant owners is implementing CO2 meters into the restaurant. CO2 is a great proxy used to measure the virus um, in the community because the virus is spread through um, air par uh, particles. Um, and that idea came from Japan. I, I was in Japan. They're very innovative. I think that's like a really interesting idea. A couple of restaurants have added that as an extra mitigation technique. I'm very as a way proud of, of showing how much the air is turning yeah, over. Yeah, so ultimately... Uh, the outdoor air quality is usually 400 parts per million of CO2. And if it gets like above 800 or above 1,000 really in that area, you're starting to breathe the air that someone else has breathed out. And then ultimately you think you're in a situation where the virus could spread, especially among asymptomatic people, which is the people that are going to restaurants. Yeah. I think that's very outside the box thinking that I'd bring to city council. I think it's very innovative. And I think it's like something that I've seen works like in other places of the world that... Um, could definitely work for us here. Keeping restaurants open, keeping people employed, that's one of the highest priorities for me. I, I think like the business community here, um, it shouldn't be business versus working class. We're all one of the same. The, of, uh, a great business community is a great um, community in general. Um, and if we keep them open, I think that's great for everyone involved. Great. Sam, thank you very much. Thank you so much. You know, we really appreciate you taking the time and, and uh, running for council. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. My, our pleasure. And uh, thank you all for your support in keeping this program on the air and for tuning in today to get to know your candidate a little bit better.